All right, good evening, everyone. Thank you all for coming out for ProCon at USC, and welcome to everyone on Facebook Live. Uh, with, tonight, we're going to be tackling the topic of public education. Is it broken? And if so, how do we fix it? I'd like to thank our partners at Unruh Institute and our sponsor, the uh, Arthur N. Roop Foundation, for making these events possible. I'm Tracy Day Francesco from ProCon.org. For anyone not familiar with us, we do the pros and cons of controversial issues. We're a nonprofit website. We don't care which side you come down on, we just want you to be informed in your opinions. So our mission at ProCon.org is to promote critical thinking, but we also think that civil discourse is more important now than it ever has been. How many of you here are on social media? Raise your hands. Twitter, Facebook, other websites people over 30 don't know about yet. We'll find out, your mom will find out soon, and then and she'll ruin that too for you. Um, so if you're on social media, you all know what uncivil discourse looks like, right? We don't need to talk about that. But what our fantastic panel tonight is going to do is model civil discourse. And uh, we'd ask everyone on your way in to take a vote before the debate if you're pro or con on this issue. Is public education broken? So if you didn't have a chance to do that, fix it in your mind right now what your opinion is. And then on the way out, we'd ask everyone to do the after vote too. So if you missed it, you can do your before and after on your way out. Um, next week, we'll be back talking about housing issues in Los Angeles. So we hope you'll join us Monday night at the Santa Monica Pier at 6 p.m. and then back here again, same time, same place. And I'll hand it off to Bob. Uh, hi, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Bob Shrum, the director of the Unruh Institute. Uh, the program next Tuesday night, I, I actually call why is the rent too damn high? Uh, <laughs> and uh, this Thursday, we are hosting an all-day conference on the new electorate that will examine age, gender gaps, racial divides, and millennial voters. It's from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. in the Ronald Tudor Campus Center. Uh, we've got a lot of RSVPs. The wait list is there, but I'll tell you honestly, if you show up, we'll find you a seat. Uh, I'm now gonna introduce the panel and the moderator, and then I'm gonna sit down. Makaya Lee serves as Vice President of the Compton Unified School District Board of Education and he's former president of the Los Angeles County Schools Trustees Association. Uh, he's not the only vice president here. Uh, Nick Melvoin, who represents District 4 on the Los Angeles Unified School District uh, Board, School Board, uh, was elected vice president of the board today. Uh, how long have you been there? Uh, two and a half months. Two and a half months, so that was, that was quick. Uh, he worked for uh, Barack Obama for the Domestic Policy Council in the White House the U.S. Attorney's Office and Teach for America. Jason Spencer is Principal Advisor to State Superintendent Tom Torkelson at the California Department of Education. Now, I'm not moderating, A, because I don't think I should moderate everything, B, because, to be honest, uh, Nick and his family are close friends of Mary Louise and mine, and number three, because we have a better moderator, Howard Bloom, uh, who covers education for the Los Angeles Times, and he co-hosts an absolutely excellent public affairs show on KPFK called Deadline LA. Okay, it's deadline for us. Go ahead. Okay, uh, so uh, grab your mics. Now, there's a lot of ground to cover today, so I'm just gonna ask that you keep your answers pretty short, and, and there's just so much going on here. So education in Los Angeles, is it, is it broken? How can we fix it? What's working, what's not? How can we move forward in a way that serves students and families adequately and prepares, prepares students for the future and also treats the employees well and provides a solid education? Those are big questions. So one thing I want to get into because it's at the top of the news and we don't know everything about it, but we have uh, three people either in public office or closely associated with public office and we have a, a very unusual situation of a school board uh, member just was president who faces campaign charges I'm just wondering how our panel sees this case and the ramifications of it I realize we don't know everything about it there's also a presumption of innocence but it, it's that topic is such at the top of the news that I don't think I can moderate this panel without getting some reflections on it. So who wants to take that on first? I'll defer to Nick. <laughs> um, okay, well, I guess... That, that's, a, that's a practice and he volunteers somebody else, right? <laughs> yes, I'm happy to discuss it. It is a, a colleague of mine. So first of all, thanks so much um, to uh, the Unruh Institute, to ProCon for having us, and for all of you, to all of you for coming. Um, 
I, uh, the, the context for those who aren't familiar is that our previous school board president was recently indicted for campaign finance violations. The allegations are that he reimbursed members of his family um, who donated to his campaign. There's also some questions about the motivation uh, because unlike a city council race where you have matching funds if you get enough grassroots donations, or unlike a case where a donor wants to give more money than they're legally allowed and so they might give to their friends or families, uh, in this context school board members are allowed to donate uh, unlimited amounts to their own campaign. Um, I think it's problematic. I think it speaks to, to larger issues. You know, without knowing the details of this of Ref's case and, as Howard said, presuming innocence. You know, and this is something I was just talking to students about uh, a few minutes ago. But um, campaign finance in this country is broken. Uh, as candidates, we've had to spend most of our time raising money. Um, you have to, you, my race was the most expensive non-mayoral municipal race in history. Seems like the number keeps changing. Uh, I've re read $17 million spent on it, I've read $8 million spent on it, but you know, I think we can all agree even a million dollars spent on a school board race is probably too much. But um, you know, until we kind of at the federal level put some guardrails in place, uh, this is how it is. And so, it's, and it's not just the uh, Citizens United kind of uh, you know, corporations are people loophole because that account, that super PAC spending only accounts for like 30 to 40 percent of campaign finance spending nationwide. It's just that it costs a lot of money. We have now billion dollar presidential elections. And as a candidate, it really, most of my time was spent trying to raise money to get my message out, running against an incumbent, understanding that there are big moneyed interests on all sides. And I think it can lead to kind of this pressure to uh, do what you need to do to put money on the board. I think it distracts from the big issues. In Ref's case, he was a first time candidate from the community running. Um, I think there's also issues about his particular case where we're talking about $25,000. Um, usually these are settled by uh, a kind of a, a fine and a slap on the wrist. Maybe it's still something that someone would resign for, but to go to a felony charge when you have the current occupant of the White House who you know is clearly kind of benefiting from millions of dollars in um, personal uh, gratification from his position. You know, I think there are conversations about equity as well. But I, I, I'm not defending it. I think it's a problem. But to me, it speaks to larger issues around campaign finance and how do we elect people to office. There are things we can do to fix it. Public financing of, uh, pu public financing of elections. Seattle is doing something where they're giving kind of vouchers to their citizens to say, you have $100 you can spend on an election. Uh, but we are going to need some federal action at the constitutional level to kind of close this Citizens United loophole. Makai, did you want to add anything to it, or Jason? Yeah, perhaps I would just simply state that I echo the sentiments, and I'll also state this. All of us, as a preacher once said, sin and fall short of the glory of God. You cannot take away the contributions that REF has made with respect to public education on behalf of underserved and marginalized children. And we should not shy away from the issue at hand and so we continue the work forward, and whatever will be, will be. But again, there's a tremendous amount of work that needs to be done with respect to public education in Los Angeles County, and I think that this issue is, is a, a simple impediment to that success. He'll get over it, we'll move forward, and all of us shall overcome. Jason, did you want to add anything? Yeah, not a, a whole lot to add. I just want to, I mean, I think the, the, the comment that the, the money it takes to run for office in California and in Los Angeles County and this um, sort of idea of being beholden to the folks that got you elected and, and the goal around, you know, a 100% voting record with the organizations that help you get elected. I think things like that create real challenges for the, for the types of, having the types of debates that we're talking about here, being able to um, sort of have that permeable barrier between the two sides and, and get to civil discourse and, and get to some collaborative, um, you know, sort of comprehensive solutions that are going to take, you know, give and take on both sides. And I think the, the, the position that a lot of elected officials are in of having to be beholden to folks because there's so much money needed to be raised um, is really the issue. I'd, I'd agree with Dick on that. Okay. Uh, one, one of the cutting edge issues in Los Angeles is the proper role of charter schools, and, and we're certainly not going to make this all a discussion about charter schools, but, but we should touch at least briefly on the subject, and probably everybody on this panel agrees that they are in favor of good schools of many types, and I, I don't, I th I'm pretty sure on this panel nobody's going to say shut down all charter schools because they are an innate evil. I, you know, we'll assume for the sake of argument that 
there are good charter schools that all of you would support keeping open because they are helping some students. So let's, let's see if we can get beyond that and, and say, well, is there, is there any limit to the growth of charter schools that would be good for students? So, I mean, would it be 50% of students in LA Unified? Should you just keep opening new charter schools and just let the good ones rise to the top and the bad ones fail? Or is there a cost in having schools go out of business? And, and you really don't want to avoid that. So what, what is the proper role of charter schools and are there limits to charter growth? And um, I will let Jason go first this time. Okay. Um, I think the, the greatest sort of disservice to, to students in the, in the education system is that we haven't realized the promise of the, of the charter movement from you know, a generation ago when it started. These were supposed to be innovation labs. These were supposed to be places for learning um, innovative strategies, for learning things that would work for students that would then seed the rest of the public system. So I would almost posit that the question of how many charter schools should be open, what percentage of students should be in charter schools is, uh, is really sort of missing the point that you know, charter versus you know, traditional public versus magnet versus pilot, um, I'm agnostic on that front. We want good schools for all students. The, the rationale for giving flexibility to charters and how they deal with unions and, and sort of the, the, you know, the, the ed code that's this tall, the, the rationale for giving them that flexibility was so that the rest of the system could learn from those successes. And that is, that's the greatest failure of the system. That's, that's right, the piece it, that we it seems need to, almost to focus as the, on. The mission has changed a little bit because charters originally began as, a, as, a, as an idea within teacher, a teachers union, right, in Rochester. But, uh, and I'm not saying that this is necessarily bad or good. I'm just saying that now charters are the end of themselves for many of their supporters. And they would act, there are some people who would actually like to see LA Unified become an all-charter system. And just the, you'd have a tiny district office that would just have some management function and maybe a service function. Um, I mean, that is one possible extreme of this. Uh, so, and you can jump in on that point, but let's give Nick a shot too. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think charter schools are symptomatic of kind of the threshold question we're debating tonight, which is, is public education broken? Because they grew out of a need. You know, let's not forget that affluent families in this country have had choice in where they go to school for generations. You can choose to move into a neighborhood with better public schools if you have means, or you can choose to go to private school if you have means. The minute that the benefits of that choice inure to poorer families, I think that's a good thing. Um, so the question then, to the larger question is, okay, then what? Well, if parents are opting out of the public school system now more equitably, because you don't have to have means to do it, uh, is that a good thing? And, and this is where the charter movement, and I think Jason and I agree, kind of there were three goals. There was choice, which is this equity piece. There was competition, which was Districts like LA Unified have had monopolies on education for generations, and so the idea was now if parents have a choice, districts have to say, well, we're going to offer something new or we're going to offer something better. And then three was this R&D and these incubators of innovation. And I think it's interesting that, that, Howard, you brought up the unions because I think where we all kind of went wrong as districts and as unions, I was a member of the teachers' union, is in acknowledging that some of the things that made charters work were a need to change the rules. Uh, you know, I hear a lot, oh, charters are, it's unfair because they're playing by different rules. That was the point of the charter movement. The rules weren't working, let's give some schools new, new rules. And instead of saying, what are those rules, uh, why do we need to change those rules and bringing that flexibility to the districts, flexibility in teacher hiring, not just based on seniority, flexibility in teacher, teacher promotion, not just tenure, firing, not just young teachers. Uh, instead of saying, let's bring that to districts, people saw that as anathema to maybe their, their bottom line if they were a union and fought it. And I, I think where we agree, and we debated this last night, is the, the goal, the, the natural mitigation of charter growth in LA should be that we're, as a district, doing everything we can to provide the best options, so we don't need to create new charters. Uh, but until we're at that point, it, you know, me as someone who went to both public school and then had the option to go to private school, it's hard for me to say that other parents shouldn't have that right um, because they don't have means. Okay, Makai, uh, jump in on this anywhere you like. Historically speaking, the discussion of accountability within public education did not arise until 1992 in California with the passage of the Charter School Act. Now, that's to say that we've had a significant challenge in this state with accountability for poor children because all of us know that when the public school system first began, it never had in mind to educate 
blacks, and others. And so we've struggled all of these years and never had an opportunity to look at the, the various learning modalities that children could benefit from. And so now you have an issue that arises, 1992, the creation of charter schools with an initial cap. The legislature initially capped. And then, of course, that cap began to grow, and others began to utilize the issue as a wedge issue, another way to bring about inequities. Marguerite Lamont said it best. We're living and existing. And, and Marguerite Lamont is a former board member for LA Unified, who is a career, uh, a career LA Unified administrator for the most part. Exactly. Very respected woman who's, who's since passed. But you're managing a system of schools where charter becomes problematic. You have for profits that actually generate a profit off of public education. You have non profits. You have lax accountability. And so when you have lax accountability within some aspects, then you get what you get with respect to elements of corruption that creep in. And so I think that the public school system ought to have the same flexibility in many instances as charter school management organizations. And I do believe that there ought to be more collaboration. But again, again, I go back to the fact, 6.5% black children in public education in California, underachieving, Latino children, underachieving. The debate cannot just simply be about charter and be about traditional. The debate has to be about looking at ways in which to enhance the quality of learning through every single modality that we can possibly bring to bear. So this can be a discussion of rich and poor because we already know, we already know where we've been as far as California is concerned post Prop 13. Post Prop 13, what do we get? We get a system now where public school systems are poorly funded in this state, one of the richest states in the union, however public education is poorly funded far beyond many southern states and we laugh at those folks, we call them different. But look at us, you know, as we begin running around town talking about this progressive language and what have you, yet and still there's so much underachievement or so much poverty right in this community where we're sitting. So again, again, we can debate the merits of charter public, we can debate the merits whether there should be a cap or there should not be a cap. At the end of the day, in my humble estimation of what the numbers show, children are still underachieving, especially children who are marginalized, disenfranchised, and underprivileged. And that's really the discussion of the day. And I think just to jump in, I mean, I, I think Micah makes a lot of good points. One, this charter district divide really sucks all the air out of the room. You know, and it kind of goes back to that campaign finance issue. When the largest lobbies are the teachers union and the charter schools and they're spending the money, that's what gets reported. And what's not talked about is the historically underachieve the historical underachievement of communities of color, the fact that California is 44th, 45th out of 50 states in per pupil funding. Uh, and I also think the point about charter, you know, it's important to realize that charters is now a loaded word, but there are different types of charters. We have no for-profit charters in LA. We're actually authoring a resolution to kind of solidify that. Right now, it's just a recommendation. We're going to try to solidify that. We also have a mixed quality of charters nationwide, whereas most studies, the, Cre the Stanford Credo study is a good one to go to, show charters in LA outperforming district schools. You have the kind of Betsy DeVos type model. Then you have charters. Bernie Sanders supports charters. Barack Obama um, proclaimed National Charter School Week. And I, I don't think that charters are a panacea, but I think we should just learn and we should ask parents why they're making that choice to replicate uh, those practices. Okay, so uh, I'm, I'm going to and ask our panelists to keep their answers a little shorter, okay. even though there was, they were lovely, but we want to get to more things. So one question, you, you debated, uh, I don't know what forum you debated Nick last night, whether it was a classroom or a bar, but where did you disagree with him on charters exactly? I think the, the, the main disagreement is, is around the how, right? And, and that, the, the ability for, um, you know, for a charter to, to come into a district, and last night we used this term, you know, our charters, some, you know, they're stealing students or they're stealing revenue, and, and I wouldn't frame the debate that way, but the reality for a district, when a charter, when, when students leave a district for a charter, and when, a, when a, a charter operator comes in and says, you know, to a, to a local school board, you know, your district is failing, and therefore we're going to open a school and we're going to take 600 students out of your ADA into this charter school, the ability of districts to adjust 
adjust to that removal of, of those dollars from their budget in the short term is challenging. And the reality of the situation is the, the parents and the families that are proactive enough to be making that choice to, to leave a traditional system and go to a charter school are exactly the parents and the families that we need advocating for and supporting the public system and the traditional public school system. So you are immediately putting a tr the traditional system at the disadvantage there. And then if you try to compare those two schools, so you have a, 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 a school of, of parents that just you know, made it a proactive decision to move out of a traditional system and go, and go to a better option, right? And then you have all the parents who weren't aware of that or who didn't know that or who didn't have the resources to realize that was an option and do it. And the parents of those students are left in one system and the other parents have moved to another system that has some wonderful things about it. But then you compare those apples and oranges and you say, well, this, this, this group is outperforming that group. Well, no kidding. I mean, USC ought to outperform uh, you know, a community college or, you know, or a, a play, you know, there's, there's, there's gonna be disparity when you're creating a system like that. And I think to echo you know, Makai's point at the beginning, we've gotta be finding a way to serve all kids. And when 9% of the students in this state are in charter schools and 90% are still plus are still in traditional schools, to, to, to say that the, the, the charter schools outperforming the public schools is any sort of victory forgets that 90% of our students are still not in that system. And when we're talking about a point that Nick made last night, when zip code is the greatest indicator of your success in school, we've got a lot to do as a community um, to find those things that work in every modality, more personalized learning, more opportunities for students to hands-on learning, to understand what careers are out there for them, to understand why school is important. And those are things that need to be happening across the system, not just in one segment. Okay, so one thing that your answer alluded to were, uh, had to do with the budget. Like if, if the charter sector grows, it is taking money out of the school district. And um, that, although it's hard to deny those students the opportunity Absolutely. to make a choice that works for them, despite the consequences for the school district, but there are, there are students left behind. Let, let, let's look at the budget situation in LA Unified. Now, LA Unified uh, has a budget crisis. It's, not, it's certainly not caused by the growth of charter schools alone, and, and we're not gonna be able to take on the whole budget issue with state funding. And in fact, we've already talked a little bit about the fact that California gets less than some states, so you don't have to go into that Most again. States. But what are the elements of the budget problems that are facing LA Unified in particular, but also schools across the state? And what are some of your thoughts on that? So let, let's look at your district, uh, Compton. Uh, how, how well are you funded, and, and what do you do about it? What's the, what are the big problems? Well, b very quickly, get a couple quick answers. So both of us, LA Unified, Compton Unified, the 1,000 school districts in California and the 1,000 or so charter school systems and the community colleges all eat from one trough known as Prop 98, passed by the California voters in 1988. Constitutional amendment to simply suggest and state there's full funding of, of, there's funding of public education and it's codified by the voters. Now, it is not a tremendous amount of money as much as we need, and local control funding formula sounds great in principle. However, some issues with respect to the budget. And, and just, just for the audience, so there's, in addition to this Prop 98 bucket of money, Governor Brown has, has created something called the local control funding formula, and it took a lot of the money created by the growth in the economy in recent years and tried to re redistribute more of it to uh, needier districts, but you're about to go into some issues so, with that. So let me just simply say this. What he, to your point, let me digress to your point. What he did is he dissolved redevelopment agencies created in the 70s to eradicate economic blight within the urban communities of California. So he never really cared for Prop 13, and he never really liked redevelopment agencies. So it was very expedient to dissolve the redevelopment agencies because they, in many instances, were not passing through the money as stated in the Redevelopment Act, as well as to satisfy Prop 98. In the city of Compton, the school district, some 40 million. As a matter of fact, I led the lawsuit to sue the city because the city owed the district 40 million that they were failing to pass through. So now fast forward to today. Increased pension costs. California Public Employees Retirement, CalPERS. California State Teachers Retirement, CalSTRS. Increased pension costs beyond belief. Special education encroachment. Whole nother discussion, we won't go there. That's an increase 
Other post-employee benefits, OPEB liability for LA Unified no. and Compton. And what is that? Other post-employee benefits, paying for those that are retired. Health care. Health care. Okay. Unbelievably high. All of this comes out of your general fund, and you have to satisfy that. So by the time you get through paying all of this and taking care of adults, 80 plus percent of school districts' budgets are generally people, human resources. By the time you get down to curriculum and instructional design, student nutrition, diminutive number. So when we talk about putting money back into the classroom, another cliche, it just sounds cute to say. Most of that money goes into human resources. If you hire the wrong individuals, you're stuck like a truck. You're stuck with them forever. So there are more issues than just simply the budget. And at greater issues, we could be here all day talking about the woes of public education. Well, well that's, a, that's a great start. So build on that, uh, you know, without repeating that, let's build on, the, on those topics. Nick, you want to take that? Yeah, well, I think, I mean, Michael alluded a little bit to special ed. There are some uh, real inequities baked into the system. So, for example, there's a federal law called the Individual with Disabilities Education Act, IDEA, and it mandates that all students are served with special needs are served. And it's something that we would all agree needs to happen. But it's not fully funded. It's funded at about 25, 30%. So the federal government says you have to educate all these kids, doesn't give us the money. The way that we allocate special education funding in the state of California is based not on need, but on students. So if you're a school of 100 kids and you have 90 kids with disabilities, you get the same amount of money as if you're a school with 100 kids and you have one kid with a disability. So this encroachment that Micah talked about is we don't have enough money from our special ed buckets to cover all of our students with special needs, so we have to take from the general fund. Another issue in addition to these inequities, um, he alluded to the uh, post-employment benefits, you know, LAU Unified has now a $13.9 billion unfunded liability, which means that we've been promising retirement benefits. We're the only district in the country that gives lifetime benefits. Actually, you're not the only. You're, you're Without any contributions yeah. to active employees and retirees. So when you have hit a certain amount of years of service in LA Unified, you and your family for the rest of your life get free health care without any co-pays or premiums. So that number keeps going up and we haven't been funding it. And actually our average contribution per employee every year, our average payment is about $10,600. That is about equivalent to the amount of money we get per child. So you're looking right now at, we, you know, if we just took all the money we got and paid it out on health care, it would barely cover our current expenses. The other thing with LA Unified, and then I'll turn it over to Jason, is we have in the last decade lost 100,000 students. Okay, some of that is charter growth, some of it is demographic trends, live births are down. It's about half and half. Half and half. So uh, demographic trends, live births are down, and also the cost of living is pushing people out of LA. And we have not cut our costs uh, adequately. Now, to, you know, this is something Jason and I talked about yesterday. If one student leaves a school, you still have to keep the lights on. But when 100,000 students leave a school, you have to have some tough decisions about school consolidation and about downsizing and about cutting central bureaucracy. And the district, in my estimation, has not made those tough decisions. So when you lose 100,000 students, you're losing that revenue, but you're also losing that cost. You have 100,000 students less that you have to educate. So maybe it's not a one-for-one one parity, but you should be able to reduce costs, and our district has not been able to do that. So now we have what some are referring to this death spiral, where every year you're losing students, you're losing revenue, but your costs are stagnant or increasing. And it, you know that's what I just came from today as we're looking at, then how do we also give teachers a raise that they might deserve when we don't even have enough money to kind of keep it where it's at. And when we come back, you'll have the answer to these problems. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, but before, uh, just I mean, on, on this topic, I think the the the, the charter, the, the question about charters and this this comment about special ed encroachment that's come, come up, I think is an important one. In Inglewood Unified, a district that I've been spending a lot of time in the last few months and for the last couple of years, um, the the percentage of special ed students that are funded in you know, a district that has one is funded you know with the same numbers one that has a hundred and and, and and depending on the size of your district right and, and in, is, is in, that also an issue with charter schools that well that it is but so here's the issue that's happened in Inglewood is charter schools have come in and 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 again they haven't stolen students haven't stolen revenue but they have peeled off students that were in the district the percent the total number of students has shrunk the number of students special education students has essentially stayed stagnant what that shows me over the five or six year trend is that charter schools are not taking their fair share. It's not intentional. It's not something they're doing you know, intentionally, but 
parents of students with special needs recognize that those needs are generally better served in a larger system by a district than a single charter school. So parents of students with special needs are staying in the traditional system while students of parents of, of means or of awareness that want some, that want a better or a different choice or option for their students are leaving, which means that in Inglewood Unified, you know, at eight, nine, ten percent is a pretty average number in a district for, for students with disabilities. That number has gone from nine to 11 to 13 to 17 to almost 21 percent of the students that are currently in the Inglewood Unified School District are students with disabilities. That doesn't mean that one in five students in the city of Inglewood are students with disabilities. That means that the parents and those families of students who weren't have left and the encroachment in that district is in the in the realm of $35 million on a $100 million budget. Mackay, I mean, Mackay, it's you, it's impossible you, to operate in that environment in a traditional public school system. Have you noticed that phenomena in Compton oh, as well? Oh, absolutely. So $30 million, $30 million for special education. Compton puts up $20 million. The feds, feds put up $10 million. Now, understand some. Most of our funding does not come from the federal government. And let me also underscore this point. When the IDEA Act passed in 1978, it calls for 40% funding. And that was, that was the federal government law that provided both requirements for district to serve right. students with an appropriate education, and it was supposed to provide funding, not yes. full funding, but substantial yes. funding, and it has been a, a fraction of even the promised funding. 40%? It's, it's, a, it's a system you can opt in or opt out. New Mexico was the last state to opt in. 40% is what the legislation calls. There's been no president... No president since 1978 who's funded any more than 18%, including President Obama, who I truly believed and had hoped would have understood that tremendous amounts of needs within the urban corridors of America centers around the need for enhanced and increased special education services and resources, school-based health centers and the like. The funding never came. Bipartisan, bipartisan effort, Congressman Jarrett, out of Northern California, I think it's District 1, Hoffman, Jared Hoffman, I believe, yep. uh, moved a bipartisan effort, didn't go anywhere. So, so these are some issues that can help a school system financially, and LA Unified's encroachment is, is beyond belief. It's literally beyond a billion, belief. A billion, a $7 million budget, a billion one every year, comes from our general fund to our special education. Okay, well, so... Um, Nick, you did a great job laying out the problems. Can you give us any hope that, that they might be solved? What would you do? Uh, give us a couple of possible solutions. Well, I think, you know, there's, when you understand that we are an underfunded district, there's way to kind of, to get to solvency, there's cost cutting and then there's new sources of revenue. And I think districts like LAUSD need to do both. We need to be more efficient uh, with how we spend our money. Um, one of the things that we've been sued uh, because of and actually settled uh, 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 my first day in office was the ACLU sued us because this local control funding formula where money is supposed to go to the student and it's supposed to go to students in three uh, distinct categories, English learners, foster youth, and um, uh, students living in poverty. And our district was, the allegation was taking the money and paying it out kind of to teacher salaries, actually to special education. And you really see in that lawsuit kind of this robbing Peter to pay Paul. I mean, these are all really valuable uh, needs that districts have. So one is to be more transparent, which is what we've called for, so you can see how we're spending money. The district got a lot of flack for the iPads, um, MISIS, which was our student attendance and information system, the way that you now at USC, you know, it's how you would register for classes and get your grades, cost the district about $174 million to build. The district spent $300 million over the course of four years settling cases of sexual abuse, uh, teachers and students, money out of the general fund. So I think one, we have to be more transparent and use our money more wisely. But two, and I think this goes to this, this point about the coalitions that might form, is we need to be advocating advocating for more funding in public education. I co-authored a resolution that the board passed a few weeks ago asking for full funding of IDEA. We do not expect it to happen under this administration, but we have to keep sounding the trumpet there. The union has come, the teachers union has come with a bargaining proposal, and one of their proposals is us joining forces to go up to Sacramento and trying to double the per pupil funding to 20,000. I'm there, sign me up. And I think that we need to, you know, this is where the charter district divide I think has been um, corrosive to our efforts to come together because in a state like California, especially with the progressive base, we should be coming together on um, more funding for education. And also, one of the reasons that districts like ours 
have had to suffer some of these financial consequences is I think because of the abdication of other elements and other governments to take care of people. You know, one of the reasons we have a $13.9 billion unfunded healthcare liability is because we don't provide equitable healthcare in this country. One of the reasons that districts like ours now serve three meals a day to students, uh, breakfast in the classroom, lunch, and now we have a supper in the classroom program, is because students aren't getting the access to nutrition that they need. So part of my hope too would be to kind of coalesce around other progressive organizations to advocate for basic services and more funding. But but are you are you ta I wonder if you're taking on too much. I mean, yeah, those are good points, but the the you know, the district also took on the uh, the cost of for example providing health benefits for part-time employees and these are typically the lowest wage workers so they really do need these benefits but nobody else provides benefits to part-time employees they they did it with the cafeteria workers they just recently extended the benefits they've they've led the fight on the living wage which is great for the low wage workers um, but again, they're ahead of other government agencies, and and there it sort of conflicts a bit with the education mission. Completely, and this you know it's tough. And I wasn't on the board when that decision was made, and and there were champions um, of uh, LA Unified kind of won a lot of friends for doing that, but also a lot of critics. It's tough, especially when our low wage workers are many times parents of our students. And so, you know, if you think of, and this is something we debated publicly at the board a few weeks ago when we were supporting a resolution to provide a kind of summer bridge funding for our really low wage workers who don't get paid over the summer months and really can't make their summer rent, is that, you know, if your theory of change is that the way to elevate communities out of poverty is through great schools and great jobs, LA Unified has been trying to do both. And it's really hard, and it's not incumbent necessarily on school districts to be in charge of educating kids and providing jobs. But we are, and, and you know, I think kind of both of our efforts are suffering, especially when you consider the numbers that I um, mentioned earlier well, on right, you've benefits. just added a potentially another $50 million hit to the budget by supporting that well, very well-intentioned policy. Uh, Makai, what about in Compton? I mean, when I covered the Compton School District years ago, they were by far the largest employer, and, and when the state took over Compton for years, one of the criticisms of the auditors was that it was more of an employment agency than an education institution. What are your reflections? So the district is the fourth largest employer in the assembly district, the 64th AD. However, we are still the largest employer and the largest landowner in the community. And I would simply say that, let me digress to one point. State control is the worst thing ever. It's horrible, and it, and it actually, takes away from a community's opportunity to have local governance. It's almost as if the mantra taxation without representation is most certainly an abomination when states, uh, California in particular, controls public education. And in Compton's case, in my opinion, the state did more harm than good. Right, and now the conditions for state control, and which, which is what happened in England, and actually this will be a good chance to bring you back in, is the state comes in and takes over when, the, when a district is about to go bankrupt and a, a special loan has to be paid to keep them afloat and a condition of the loan is state control until the loan is either repaid or is on a repayment schedule. But you're right, it takes away the local control. Yeah, and, and let me add another point, and I, I want to go back to something else you just said, but let me just touch this before he, he speaks on this issue relative to state control. You have an office of education, a county office of education, that should stand as an intermediary and help provide substantive support to school systems before a bill is carried and before the state superintendent's office steps in. And in many instances, that is not happening. And so when school districts throughout Los Angeles County, there are 80 school districts and 13 community college districts, and the county office of education serves as the fiscal repository, the counties have to provide necessary training to make sure that members of the board as well as school superintendents or chief business officials understand what is going on within uh, the school system other than just simply receiving the various interim reports, the first, second, and third. Right, so in other words, what you're saying is by the time the state has to, has to come in, the, the system has already failed of checks and balances. And Absolutely. that shouldn't have happened in the first lacks place. Lacks controls within governance. Lacks controls within governance. So, so that's a whole other issue. But again, again, it's important that communities understand this because by the time the state comes, and in Inglewood's case, with their declining enrollment, there's a school bond there, there's a tremendous amount of challenges. By the time it comes back, what do you have? You pretty much have a system that's ripe for charters who will then benefit from 
a decline in enrollment scenario, and they can leverage Prop 39. But let me just say this. In the Compton's case, and to what Nick is saying, the school system has to be just simply more than just a local educator. And in Compton, as Nick has stated, we're also providing food, breakfast, lunch, supper, school-based health centers, because children need to be able to have primary care. If they're gonna sustain the students, why can't the school provide that support, especially if you're providing it to the poor and the indigent? And in many instances, when you look around California, 30% Latinos living in poverty around the state, 25 plus percent black people. So if in fact the schools can't step up, what other vehicle or option do you have? Well, and so well, I believe the school yeah. has a fiduciary and a moral obligation. And in Compton, we're gonna to continue to do it no matter what the cost is, and no matter who we disenfranchise, because it's the right thing to do. We do ask a lot of our schools. Now, I'm going to take questions out here, but Jason, you haven't had a turn, and there's probably a couple of these points that you want to jump in on. So a after Jason, we're going to take questions. So be thinking of your questions. I just, on um, this question of state receivership, I think is exactly that. And folks folks say, you know, often that, you know, the state superintendent came in and, and took over in Compton or in Inglewood, but it's, there's a local legislator that runs a bill that is asking for a loan from the state. The condition of that loan is that the, you know, and even when we say the state takes over, really the state just appoints an administrator, essentially takes the power of the board and appoints a new superintendent. Still, all of the employees are still employees of the school district. The, I mean, the, 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 the system and the, the dysfunction that was there that led to um, that led to a system that you know a school district that's approaching bankruptcy still exists, and the ability of the ability that Nick mentioned earlier, or no, that Makai mentioned, you know, you hire someone, you're stuck with them forever. You're stuck like a truck, right? There is no, there's no ability of the state to come in. If if the state administrator had the flexibility of a charter management organization when it came into a, a school district and takeover, that would be a whole different story. But really, all it is is the, uh, a layer of government that's removed from local control and removed from the local area taking authority away from a locally elected board and giving it to a state administrator who essentially is another school superintendent um, who's then coming in and trying to fix the problem without the support of that local school board. And it's probably the most challenging thing I've ever seen happen in, 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 uh, in, in public education. And I really have never, have never seen it go well. And I, and I think the point of the county office being you know, from the, the concept of subsidiarity that Governor Brown is, is focusing on with this local control funding formula that the unit of government that's closest to the people is the, the most appropriate place for decisions like that to be made. This idea of state takeover of a district is, you know, is absolutely antecedent to that and I think is really um, is not necessarily an effective tool. We're, we're, we're administering it the best we can, uh, but it's not really an effective tool for school reform um, and recovery of a district at least not the way that it's laid out in state law and that it happens. It, it, I'll add this on top. It also comes with, in this case, a $1.3 million a year debt service payment into the general fund to pay back the loan that was, that was taken really at the behest of a legislator and, the, and the, the, the state legislature making that decision as opposed to a school board taking out that loan on their own. So it's really things happening to a district and to a local community um, and then someone from the outside coming in and trying trying to lead in, a, in, a, in an environment that's exceptionally challenging because a district like Englewood has been in the same death spiral of declining enrollment and declining revenue and still trying to compete and provide services. Um, it, it's, it's, again, it's the most challenging environment to run a public education system in. Uh, are you going to say something really fast? Well, yes. I just think this is kind of with the charter movement where if the rules aren't working, uh, let's try to fix them. So we hear kind of that some employees are stuck like a truck and that even the state doesn't have flexibility. You know, it's been a cause of my career as a teacher who was laid off solely because I was hired last in first out. Like, let's give districts some flexibility to make those decisions because one of the challenges with the raise is it applies across the board without regard to quality. Uh, and so you know, that's, I think, an important distinction. If we're, you know, we just have to stop accepting things as they are. If we don't think they're working, let's have that conversation, even though it's maybe the third it's a rail. tough question, though, determining quality. Uh, Micah, you're dying to yeah, say something. Definitely. Make it fast. You know, I, 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 get some questions. I just want to say this Mackay, in, in just, just two seconds. In the, in the charter world, and this is no reflection on my good friend here, Jason, because he works for the California Department of Education, okay? In the charter world, let a charter authorizer make a fiduciary mistake. They either indicted and or LA Unified, they've done this on many instances, 
will remove the charter executive and the entire board. Okay. Now, and oftentimes those are folks of color, but we won't talk about that. <laughs> let's let's go back to the, the other point. The the in this instance, you put a czar. Now, our country is founded upon a judicial, an executive, and a legislative premise. In this particular context, you put one person over the executive and over the legislative aspect. No check and balance at all. And oftentimes, these folks are running through, like Marty Joe Young, they're contracting out, slicing and dicing. And it's unbelievable. And there again, children of color suffer. And no one says anything but poor Compton or poor Inglewood. I could count numerous school systems that should have been in receivership. But oftentimes, if they're managed by other folk, their legislators or legislators will not carry that bill. In our instance, marginalized communities were the first to receive state receivership. And I can count most of the instances have been districts where people of color have managed, but I won't even go there. I'm it's just almost saying. almost exclusively, exclusively to your point. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, right. And um, okay, so questions from out. Uh, yes, I, the, the lights are bright, but I see your hand. So, yes, um, and maybe uh, do we have a microphone out there? Oh, thanks. Hi, um, my name is Hannah, and this question is for you, Nick. Um, so, as a former TFA alum. Um, I'm sure you've seen how some of the schools with the highest need and the highest rates of poverty have the lowest retention for teachers. So how do you incentivize great teachers to go to those schools with high needs so that you can affect, um, have lower dropout rates and ultimately help those students have better futures? Uh, it's a great question. You know, I began my career as a teacher in LUSD and Watts and was laid off every year. I would say, you know, to keep this brief, one, first, do no harm, right? We exacerbate this, this attrition by laying off teachers based solely on seniority. The case that I helped bring when I was a teacher, Reed versus California, was because most of our least veteran teachers are in our hardest to staff schools. Because as you get seniority, and to, Han to Hannah's point, there's no incentive to stay, um, financially or otherwise, you go to more affluent schools. So when layoffs hit, they disproportionately impact low-income schools. So schools where I grew up in Brentwood maybe lost a teacher. Markham, where I taught, lost 67% of teachers. So first, do no harm. In terms of the incentives, you know, I think the financial incentives of saying, not just touching merit pay or performance pay, but just saying if you teach at a school in certain criteria, maybe it's the lowest 10% of schools or title, the percentage of students who qualify for federal aid is 80% or something, give them a stipend. But we also see uh, in, with teacher retention studies that, that uh, salary is one of the top five indicators, but there are other things like autonomy, collegiality, you know, be a part of a culture. And so I think that these flexibilities that we talked about a lot yesterday would help incentivize, you know, people to stay. So maybe you get a little more money, but you also say you could be a teacher leader or you could also, you could be a teacher coach or here's a career path or you're going to have a little more flexibility over your curriculum. Those are the, the things that are keeping people to stay. So, so I, I wanted to use it because I want to point out that your boss, uh, Superintendent Torlickson, actually opposed some of these measures that uh, Nick is talking about because th these were the subject of lawsuits. He was on one side with his allies and the superintendent, state superintendent was on the other. So, uh, what is your response? I, I think one of the, the when we talk about incentivizing to to teach in our in our you know greatest schools of greatest need, which are you know gets back to the point that again zip code indicates success, the greatest indicator of success. There's a piece of that puzzle that's missing currently in the system, and Linda Darling Hammond talks a lot about this. We've got to be recruiting and growing our own teachers that that reflect the communities we're asking them to teach in. Because to just take you know someone like Nick and say you you, know, you really should teach in Watts, you'd be a great teacher. That's very different than having someone from Watts having someone from Compton grow up and, and look like and, and speak the, you know, really reflect and speak to a community and, and be a role model for a community versus folks always coming in from the outside because there's a $5,000 stipend attached to teaching in a challenging school. So you stick around for three years and then you bolt for a, a suburban school because it's easier and, and you have more resources and you have more support. So that grow your own model is, is an important piece of the puzzle that's missing. And one of the things we, you know, that also falls into this is the, the question around you know, teacher evaluation and, and equating that to student performance. So if, if student performance is a, a part of an evaluation of a teacher, 
I would posit, and, and many others agree, that that's a perverse incentive not to teach in the most challenging areas. And, and, and there are ways to look at growth and, and look at sort of the things that are positive things that are happening in a school or with the district. But if you're purely looking at standardized tests and whether or not 80% of your students are, 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 are uh, considered proficient on standardized tests, and if you don't achieve that mark, that's going to be a, you know, a ding on your, you know, as far as your evaluation and your ability to be a teacher. Am I going to teach in a school where 30% of the kids are reading, you know, at grade level? Absolutely not. Why would you make that choice as a teacher? Well, so well, we've got to uh, yeah, be really yeah, careful I mean, to not create to incentives against that yeah. very thing as well. But growing up folks from within communities is really the most powerful way to, to achieve that. I mean, there is a way to look at student growth as opposed to absolute performance. Absolutely. Although within a school, though, you also don't want to penalize a teacher who always volunteers to take on the tougher the students tough or for a teacher who has behavior problems in class who actually might be very successful in another setting. Another question, another question. Over there. Yes, green shirt, it looks like from a distance, although it probably isn't. I think she's green. green light. Green light, whatever. It's green. Um, my question is kind of twofold. So we've heard a wide variety of problems that are very, very complicated. And we've heard really some conceptual solutions to that. Transparency of funding, advocating for funding coming together as charter and a traditional public school. Um, it seems like the major issue is cost and, and really f the focus is adults and teachers and how do we pay our employees, right? So what are some of the solutions in the classroom that are focused on the students is the first half of my question. The second half is that you see states like Colorado who have legalized marijuana, they've invested in their schools and you know, really kind of takes cost out of that equation. With the legalization of marijuana in California, are we gonna see that as well? Makai, you wanna grab this first? Well, it's kind of interesting because for many, let me just say this, I have no concerns with respect to the legalization of marijuana, but when you're living in a community like Compton, you remember a crack cocaine epidemic that once plagued. And when you're living in other aspects or communities within LA, you remember you know, just crime and bedlam and mayhem. And so not to say that that will occur with the legalization of marijuana. Who, never, you know, who knows, right? Who knows? It, it's all a cash business and, and things typically can happen. The fact of the matter is, is that will there be this influx of cash that just simply finds its way into schools? I'm not necessarily for certain if that's the case. I know the cities are looking to benefit quite handsomely. Nick may have some perspective on this. If LA Unified seen any influx of cash as a result of dispensaries within LA. But to the second point, you know, classroom instruction, really finding a great, solid teacher who can dispense love. That's what's going to transform. No matter what happens at the boardroom, no matter what happens in Sacramento, it is a teacher's desire and ability for differentiated instructional best practices, their in-depth knowledge and use of technology. We talk about iPads, but is that really the way? Eh, not necessarily so, because you have to understand how to leverage technology in a way. Remember something, the public school system is so far behind the times. And so when you look at the use of, of, of the internet and ways in which students learn, do we actually need many of the conventions that we currently use today? You do distant learning, students come to school a few days a week, they go get some work experience, you really leverage career technical education and voc technical education. Five million jobs in this country, and who's getting those jobs? And many times they're not our children from our neighborhoods because they're ill-prepared, ill-equipped. So looking at ways in which to enhance instruction, that really falls solely on the teacher. And none of the things that we're talking about up here, we're not in the classroom leading instruction. But what we're trying to do is provide enablers to make certain that there's some success within that uh, practice. I, I think just to jump in that the question, you know, the focus on teachers and teacher quality and teacher incentives to me is actually an, an answer to your question about what's going on in the classroom because there's no greater indicator of a child's success 
in school than the quality of the teacher. You know, and one of the reasons I focused a lot on teaching and teaching quality in my career is not because teachers are the problem, it's because I think teachers are the solution. And I agree with the differentiated instruction. I think we've been looking now at the district of um, how are we evaluating our professional development? Are, are we giving teachers the training that they need and are we seeing some improvement? I think some of it, and this is an area of agreement even with I think the unions uh, nationwide is looking at our schools of education. Who's coming into the field? Um, in high performing educational countries, teachers are coming from schools like SC, and they're coming from the kind of you know, top echelon of graduates. And it's not the case here. Um, you know, the program that I was involved with, Teach for America, there's sometimes questions about, oh, well, one study says that you're only equally effective to a long-term teacher, others show that you're more effective. The idea that after five weeks of training, someone can be as good in a classroom as someone who spent four years in a school of education is ludicrous. And to me, an indictment of our traditional system of educating kids. If you got out of law school and you were only as successful in a, in a courtroom as someone who did a three-week legal boot camp, law schools would like go out of business. And so we haven't had that question about teacher quality. Who's coming in? What are we training them on? And are we kind of giving them continual improvement? Quick thoughts from Jason Just on this on This question is sort of what can be going on in the classroom. We've heard the term differentiated instruction and, and there are, you know, personalized learning, you know, blended learning, other terms for that. But the shift that the, the, the state of California has tried to push around the common core, which was this huge controversy nationwide, but there's really four things that they're focusing on, right? Creativity, critical thinking, communication, and collaboration. Those are the things that you're going to have to do in the workforce, right? You're going to have to critically think, you're going to have to be creative, you're going to have to communicate with people, and you're going to have to collaborate with your colleagues and, and folks all around you, know, around you. So focusing on those type of skills in the classroom, getting away from what my boss calls the sage on the stage, who's imparting knowledge to be memorized and regurgitated back, and then that's going to get you a high score on, this, on the standardized test, and we're all going to move on. Teaching students to think, to learn. Um, knowledge is, there's a great quote from a, a great scientist who came to our, our uh, science, technology, engineering, and math conference a year ago. And she said, you know, technology or knowledge is no longer power. Knowledge is no longer valuable. It's creativity. It's the collaboration. It's what you do with that knowledge. Anything you can create a blueprint for, I can find it tomorrow, right? Any knowledge you have that I don't know, I can find it on Google in, in seconds. So knowledge, information is no longer power. It's those skills, that creativity, that, that ability to communicate that ability to collaborate and build something new and create something new. And those are the skills that we have to be imparting schools in the, in the classroom. And you see great schools like High Tech High down in San Diego that are doing things that are absolutely amazing. But the issue is, it looks like kids are running around and it's really chaotic and it's not organized. So to a system that's designed from an agrarian 19th century model to look at the 21st century model of learning where you know, all, you know, most of the folks I see here in the audience and either younger students coming behind, the digital natives, the students that are entering kindergarten now are gonna use technologies in ways that we haven't even imagined. And listening to someone like me or Howard stand up in front of them and tell them things is pretty much pointless. So this, uh, this old school model of sort of seats in rows and everybody sit and listen to the sage on the stage, that has to end. It's starting to end in California, but because we're changing a huge bureaucratic system that's evaluated people partially on classroom management skills and how well you can get students to sit down and be quiet and listen to you, that's not the way this next generation is gonna learn. And unless we flip that system on its head and give kids engaging, hands-on experiences with the arts and with music and with creativity, multiple languages, dual language immersion programs, all the things that science tells us about brain development, for kids at the young, especially ki kindergarten through third grade ages, if we don't do that absolutely differently, we're going to miss the boat, and, and it's leaving the dock. Okay, so that, that was a pretty good closing uh, argument here, but, but uh, it, does anyone have a burning question that they would like to ask? Um, now, do I have a commitment from my panel that you'll treat this as a lightning round, like 30-second yes, yeah, answers? Right. So maybe we can get in a couple more questions. So we'll start way in the back. And I, we'll get in a couple more. So I really, lightning round, OK? And that applies to the question asker as well. Hi, so I just have a quick question about the political context behind some of this. So uh, the people who make laws about education at a statewide level are not as intimately involved with the educational system as you guys are. And to the best of my knowledge, it appears that there's a kind of polarization between what you might call the charter advocates and the traditional public school advocates uh, at a statewide level. So given that there's that divide, uh, what kind of solutions is, are, uh, is, 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 are possible at a statewide level 
uh, when you have that kind of stark differentiation in worldviews, even though at a, on the ground level, the divide might not be as stark as you guys are. Okay, so make one point, not all the points. Uh, I think one point on this one is that the ability for those two sides to collaborate and come together, there are folks that would say, you know, the charter movement, there's corruption in it, there's no accountability, there's no oversight, and the charter advocates don't want any of that in the system because they're afraid it'll be used against them. On the other side, right, we need better evaluation of teachers, we need better accountability for school boards, for locals, but the traditional advocates don't want that accountability because it'll be used against them. I believe if both sides came together and a meeting of the minds and gave on those margins where we all know there are bad actors in the system, System, and we actually gave more ability to remove those from the system, we would improve it from both ends. Uh, Nick? I, you know, I think it's on you, it's on citizens. I mean, people, uh, this goes back to the campaign finance conversation, the biggest lobbied interest in the state, you have the California Teachers Association, which has been the big dog for a long time. The California Charter Schools Association is quickly catching up and in some cases surpassing. So when those are the constituencies of a lot of not just school boards, but state assembly and state senators, um, you know, t t I think to a point Jason made, like that they're the that's who is doing the scorecard of were you with us. So it really is incumbent on other people to get involved. Uh, I think parents are already there. I met a lot of parents on the campaign. One kid in a charter, one kid in a district school. They're over it, but now the rest of us kind of have to have to get there as well. Okay. Next question. There was. Uh, go ahead in front. Mike microphone is on the way. Uh, so obviously we all know that DACA was rescinded recently on September 5th. And my question is, how is the LA school system attempting to support these children and their families, especially because the education system at the public level is really the only, well, government funded system that they trust and the only system that affords them education and that affords them a community. So how is it that now the, uh, the school system is planning to support them in the coming years. Yeah, so I'll try to be quick on this. Uh, the question was about DACA. There are estimates that about a quarter of our students are undocumented or the kids of undocumented immigrants. This is something that this LA Unified has been really great on even before my time, and my predecessor deserves some of the credit for that. Um, you know, one, there was a Plyler versus Doe, a Supreme Court decision years ago, said that public schools educate all kids irrespective of immigration status. But one of the things the district has done is ensure that our schools are sanctuaries, are safe spaces, um, that our school police force is in no way cooperating with ICE, um, that we're also proactively providing information for parents about um, legal resources and other resources. We've got kind of, a lot of our schools have kiosks that let parents know where they can get information. Um, we've been partnering with our school police, not just to uh, obviously not cooperate with ICE, but also, you know, put look at plain clothes outfits, put your car in the back, let's not deter parents from coming to school because of the presence of police. Um, we've been reaching out bilingually to, um, to families to let them know what their resources are. We've kind of passed a few resolutions uh, publicly opposing DACA, kind of joining together uh, to fight this. Um, we've also, you know, I think our credit goes to our teachers, you know, who have been dealing with this on the ground when students you know, how can you learn when you think when you go home, maybe your parents not going to be there? And and we've been providing resources for schools and teachers, but they've been bearing the brunt of a lot of this. So I will say that this is something we're continuing to work on. It's a priority for LUSD, and I think kind of all of our districts. It's, it's, it's a states. pretty unified front, and both uh, unions and charters are pretty are pretty much on the same page on this one. And traditional school districts. Um, one more question, maybe. Oh, oh, oh no, that's it. Uh, I, my keepers are have pulled the leash here. Okay, but uh, I, I want to thank our panelists. Uh, perhaps a, a round of applause for our panelists. <laughs> and thank you very much, and also thank you to our hosts at USC and uh, our other sponsors, and that'll be it. Great, thank you all.